organize things by project, but really it doesn't make a lot of sense because after that project's done, that software's still going and users are still going to come back with change requests and bugs and all that good stuff. Um, so yeah. This of course, and this is kind of the core of continuous delivery, does require organizational changes. I mean, you can start with not a cross-functional team, but it's going to be an uphill battle. But really, um, yeah, I mean, all the technology in the world won't save us. We need to change our organization to match this model more because we need to be able to control the process of software feature by feature being delivered every step. And the more different hands that touches, the more difficult that getting that to happen will be. So let's, uh, let's start by figuring out what your value stream is. Okay? To figure out how you make produc uh, software production ready, you have to figure out what, what, what happens to it. Okay. Can you guys see this all right? Okay. Um, so this is just an example of a, of a bakery. So you, you know, you pick a cake, go to the counter, bakers bake it, or you know, slice it up. Uh, you pay for it, you unpack it, you slice it, you cake. Okay? This is the value stream for a bakery's sales process. So what you need to do with your team is figure out what your product goes through in that same way. So you get some ideas for features, all right? Go to your, your business analysts or your subject matter experts, goes to your developers, you program it, then it hits you know QA team or department or, or whatever it is, and then gets the UAT tested, or and, you know, eventually it'll hit production. All right, now this is an important part of figuring out how to do continuous delivery. Um, in order to make, okay, then once you get that value stream, you could build what's called a deployment pipeline. And this is sort of the heart of uh, what makes continuous delivery uh, successful. So you, you can see here, we have a simple one where we have these swim lanes, delivery team, version control, build unit tests, and so forth, all the way up to release. And uh, we see that you check in the code, um, into version control, and that triggers to, to compile. It builds the unit tests, and then if that's successful, it'll go up and do the automated acceptance tests, and then you have the user acceptance tests. Your, your QA department or team usually comes in here, and then of course you release. And every every point of this, every lane here is meant to prove your software doesn't work. So how many of you are using automated testing? Okay, it works without automated testing, but automated testing makes the process really smoother. Um, and we'll talk about, you can see this probably reminds you a little bit, if you've heard of continuous integration, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, um, the first stage is the commit stage. So this is kind of the continuous integration stages. You got a server that builds, packages the code, okay? The machine does not have to be production-like at all. It just whatever scrap machine you got lying around, maybe somewhat extra workstation. All right. Um, what I see a lot of, a lot, I see some teams they have this process, but they don't package it. So the idea here is that at the end of it, I have a set package that I can say this is this version 1.12. All right. It is environment independent and uh, sort of represents what you're going to be pushing out into the world and to everybody. Uh, later stages, you could have acceptance tasks, performance tasks, you know, user acceptance tasks. These, these environments need to be as production-like as possible. Um, I, one config, one different config or one versioning difference between your SQL databases. I'm, I'm from .NET world, so we're now open source, so now I, I feel free to do presentations at PenguinCon now, so thanks for, by the way. I'm proud to finally be part of that community. <laughs> but um, and we use SQL, a lot, SQL Server a lot. So, um, you know, one version difference can cause these weird bugs to happen. I, I'm sure some of you have encountered weird, like, oh, you used 2008 and I tested it in 2012. Um, I would say um, as 
as soon as you can, if you don't have automated testing and you want to go in a direction of continuous delivery, automated testing is going to be essential at some point. It saves so much time and you have to have something that runs, that, that, that ensures you don't run into regression issues and that can ensure that things are running appropriately and you can run it on every check-in. It's really hard to do manual testing on every check-in. I mean, it would take hours. So this an automated testing suite will take minutes. Um, and in the dream is eventually even your infrastructure is automated. If you've heard of DevOps, that whole movement is based around infrastructure like uh, hardware and network and sysadmin teams working with programmers. And you know you have places like if you've heard of tools like Chef or Puppet, you know they can actually automate. They can spin up a new virtual machine, configure all the required software, ensure it's there, and then boom, your software goes right on it. I'll tell you what, right now we're not there at Rider at my product team. Uh, it's it's such a roadblock sometimes to get that hardware up there. So here are some principles about continuous delivery to help ensure that it's going to be a strong process. You want to create a repeatable, reliable build. So our idea is that to get that build into production, I push a button. So I know that version 1.12.3 is ready for production. It passed my, all my automated testing. QA said they're cool. My user acceptance guy was like, yeah, we, we, could, do, we could work with this software. Or your boss, maybe that's your boss, and he says, yeah, we can work, we, this is good enough, all right? And you push a button, and, it, and it's out there, live. I've seen it, and I've done it happen, it's really, really cool feeling. Uh, you want to automate almost everything. I mean, I, it's hard sometimes to like get out of our own shell. You know, if you've heard the whole, I can't sharpen my saw, I'm too busy cutting down trees saying, but really, um, there's a saying in continuous delivery, if, if, if something hurts, do it often, because eventually you're just going to want to automate it away. And, and automation, it saves so much time. It does. Oh yeah, I put that saying in there. Okay, cool. Um, and and the, part of making this happen is we need it trackable, so we want to keep this in version control. Not just the code, we need database changes in version control, we need config management, and if possible, infrastructure. So like virtual machines and, and config files to provision those and get them in sync all in some version control. All right, that, it, Netflix, yeah. So are you actually deploying new VMs? Um, I haven't done this myself in that realm. But from what I understand, take Netflix, I think they're doing something where they all spin up VMs dynamically. As, they, uh, as, as required, they go through a load balancing system and clustered. And, uh, Netflix actually, they don't change their servers. They just destroy their servers and recreate them. As, as they, they update their config file through their deployment manager or their uh, conf, you know, server config manager, and then they just deploy new versions and then they take down the older versions. It's physically pretty crazy. Destroy, what? Physically destroy the hardware? No, 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 it's virtual. It's virtual. They use like virtual. They're on AWS. Yeah, actually, they, 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 they go off of Amazon's. Virtual. Yeah. Virtual. So they, so it's a. They're not. They're not burning the physical servers, though. <laughs> that would be funny. They do, they have a tool though called Chaos Monkey, and, and what it does, it just goes through and just shuts off servers. It just kills stuff randomly because they want to see how resilient That's the they are. the proper way to do testing to see if you can meet the 99.9. Right, no, I, I think it was, it's a beautiful Kill, little tool. Start I, killing things in the middle yeah. of servers and see if everything is still there when you're done. Right, and I only wish that we were mature enough, my product team, to do that, but you know, we'll get it someday. Um, so done means released. And I, I mean, done, just deployed, I mean released and used in production. Okay? Um, we want to build quality in, so automated testing is important. Um, we want to build uh, you know, feature toggles so we can revert back, stuff like that. And everybody is responsible. I mean, this is a collaboration here. This is collective, not just code ownership, but this is product ownership. The infrastructure. And the infrastructure team, the, the developers, the product owner, the SMEs, we're all in this together. We all want to produce value. And there's no, you know, blame here. It's, you see a problem, you try to fix it. And behind this is this idea of continuous improvement. You know, they say this, Agile needs two things. You need iterative development and inspect and adapt. Okay? 
Um, and yet inspect and adapt means you're constantly looking at what you're doing and trying to come up with solutions to solve your top problems. Never looking and saying, because I don't know this, I'm weak. But because I don't know this, I'm going to learn this. Um, so, yeah. And it's, it's a really powerful tool it's, uh, to do continuous improvement. So here's a great guideline to kind of see where you're at, where, you're, where your product teams are at with your company. It's how long would it take your organization to deploy a change? You know, you can just read. I don't need to read the, the whole, the exact thing out. But this is a good question. I mean, you, just one line of code. How long would it take to get into production? If you're doing an open source project, a good thing to do is kind of see, I'm just going to write like, hello world. How can I get in that production? Um, can I do it with one button push? Do I need to run? Do I have to pull buttons and knobs like the Wizard of Oz? And what obstacles are there? If, 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 if the, the, the number kind of disappoints you, you say, what a lot of obstacles are there? You know, um, some things we can control and some things we can't. But you'd be surprised what sort of influence you can have in your organization. So here's some practices. Um, only build your binaries once. So I mean, I, I know that in the open source world, like, like RubyEnv, I used RBEnv, and I had to like rebuild Ruby from the source. And I was like, why do I have to do this? I didn't understand. And I know there's like a, a school of thought that's like, oh no, if you don't build it from source, you can't trust it. Um, but in continuous delivery, it's more like the idea of only build it once, and then that package should be parameterized to work multiple environments in different situations. So I don't, I don't know if there's a, f I, I don't, I, I think this, I don't, I think that's, I don't know how, how many people apply that school of thought. This is a little different school of thought there. Um, so, um, in, in .NET, we do love packages, you know, NuGet packages. We just, you know, we love our packages. I'm lazy. I don't want to build, I don't want to have to deal with anybody else's source code. Just give me a library and I'll use it. And when you have an update, I'll update it unless I really don't like it. Um, Okay, perfect. Deploy the same way to every environment. So, so this is what I found was kind of mind blowing, right? I've seen it where you have a different deployment script, your little run script, your little config values you have to change every single environment, and then someone has a checklist or has to track that, and it's or it could be in an Excel sheet or in someone's head, or uh, so there's some different ideas out there. But if you set up your build right, it doesn't matter what environment you're going to. You have this build. You know exactly what's in it because it was related to a check-in. And you can put it in any environment. And you need a new environment, doesn't matter. Just take that same build, plop it in, and apply your configs to it. And there you go. Uh, smoke test your deployments. So you want to um, make sure, obviously, working like automated is the best, but you just want to make sure once you're deployed that, you, that it's up and running. Uh, it could be as simple as just logging in. You want to keep your environment similar. Every difference is a chance for error. Um, usually in your deployment pipeline, you have a progressively more production-like environment until the point where your staging environment or UAT environment is almost exactly production, except maybe by server name. Uh, this is sometimes, for some reason, for a lot of companies, hard to do, uh, usually due to licensing issues, but at least in the Microsoft world or .NET world. Uh, if anything fails, stop the line. Uh, you got to understand it. Getting the build releasable is the number one goal. No matter how many cool features we have, if if we can't, you know, if we're at a place, if one of our things says you can't, this isn't working, then everybody needs to be responsible to make sure that then works and fix it. Uh, so this is like a, an interruption in whatever flow, whatever features you're working on. All right. So who's heard of continuous integration? Okay. Oh, good. So a lot of you. Um, so this is an extension of continuous integration. Um, so this is some basics for those of you who might not have heard of it. You know, everybody checks into a main branch, okay? Uh, oh, those who do continuous integration, this is a fun experiment I've seen. Uh, so, so, so keep your hands raised if you do continuous integration. Okay. So how many of you check in at least once a day, if not more? Okay. Now, how many of you stop? What you, how many of you have your team stop what you're doing, or uh, and fix the build anytime something goes wrong? Okay, well, that's good. Actually, we go one stage further. You can't check it in if the automated tests fail. 
Yeah, it was right. Sometimes though, you, you run it and it works in your machine, and you're, you know, it no. works on my machine approved, and then. We've got, at this point, 10,000 tests in the, in the unit testing, and if any of those fail, your yeah. check-in is rejected. Oh, yeah. Uh, we've seen some of ours, though, they make it past, and there might be like some small environment difference, and it just breaks the build. Or, well, we work with TFS, and TFS is horrible. So it, 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 it will just like forget to add files, and so it works on your machine, and then you check it in, and oh, I don't have these files. And you're like, okay. Well, that's why well, we run Jenkins for that. Oh, yeah. And you I wish can't we could. get into the main branch if the branch you're on doesn't compile. Oh, okay. And then if it pulls the main branch, it then tries the unit test there again mm -hmm. and won't let you check in if those fail. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's pretty standard uh, continuous integration uh, server setup. So, um, and one of the interesting things that I learned about this is using branch by set abstraction for architectural changes and then using feature toggles to switch off incomplete. Effect. So the, we get the scary idea, you know, uh, we build these feature branches sometimes and they say, well, I can't touch the main code, it'll destabilize it. Well, it's like, but if you just build an if statement, says, well, if this is activated, then run this algorithm. If it's not, then run this algorithm. And you only need this at the entry points. You know, like it could be a menu item on your UI. Yeah? Are you doing it at writer? Yeah. Uh, do you guys do it via database, web config? Like a right now it's web config. I'll explain more afterwards okay. about that specific situation. Um, and we're kind of transitioning. Because it's some of this stuff is new to dealing with that. But this is really cool. Facebook says they have every feature that will be released in production already for the next six months before they release it. They just haven't turned it on. They just haven't flipped the switch. So, well, I was going to add. I think oh. what they do also is they they test it in you know real live environments mm -hmm. for a limited number of customers. Yeah, they actually, I was going to cover that canary releasing. Um, I'll explain. Yeah, I'll talk actually, a little more about that. The one thing that came better is Google. They typically have thirty to forty versions of the search engine up and running. Wow. That is impressive. So here's just some testing. This guy, Brian Merritt, came up with these, uh, basically categorized all the testing. So you can see it. It might not be easy to read. Um, but you can see we have um, different, over here, you have business facing, technology facing. You have critiquing the product and supporting the team. And then you have, over in this corner, automated, in this corner, manual. And it kind of says what you're likely are to be. So you hear supporting the team. Your unit tests and component tests or integration tests are going to be uh, automated almost all the time. Uh, your functional tests, your story tests, and simulations could be a little mix of automated and manual. And your exploratory testing, which is like I'm just going to start messing around and start banging keys on the screens, you know. Or your user acceptance testing is, is going to be manual. And then you can do performance and load testing and security testing, tools. So it's a good way to kind of figure out what you'll need and what gaps you have and what, you know, where to look for solutions to those. Like, for example, we don't have any tools for load testing right now. So we will need to look into that at some point. Now, so getting to what you were talking about, canary releasing. So this is something you can do after you get to a point where you can continuously deliver uh, items. Is you see you have a router, okay? And you just want to deliver, you want to test and experiment. And Etsy has a whole API for this uh, where they can say what percentage or what role that user's in. And they'll just give some users a new version. And if things go right and people like it or use it more, then they give it to everybody. If it doesn't go right, then they kind of say, oops, that never happened. Right? <laughs> Here, guys, sign this NDA. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, database migrations, OK. How many of you are using database migrations through a script, like have some database migration scripts? You do? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, these need to be just like code. They need to be uh, source controlled or version controlled and um, scripted and environment independent. So I, I can ensure my database schema is the same in every environment, all right, as it gets deployed. And this allows us to do some cool things, OK? Um, so you have to have something that manages the scripts. We use Fluent Migrator. It's a .NET open source tool. Um, and you have to apply an expand and contract methodology we use. So we don't do database rollbacks. 
what we do is we say the database is in this state and it's got to be able to support one iteration earlier all right, of, of versions. So when we deploy, we have multiple deployable components like a web and a scan, a scan gun app and a web app. And so they could be not 100% be the same version at the same time. So, if, um, so my database has to make sure I, like I, I can't just rename a column. I'm going to actually create a new column. And then later, I'm going to remove it. Expand, and that's what the expand and contract. In between, you have this transition phase. Uh, and then, of course, it helps to abstract the data access in some fashion. We use in Hibernate um, as an ORM tool and uh, does that stuff. And that way you can even, like, if you need a column that's not there anymore, you could still pretend it's there if you have a little bit of an abstraction in between. Uh, there are some objections to doing, yeah? So how do you support the, the multiple versions from the same database if you've got, like, a view that's wrong? Good question. I might cover some of that in the rest of the talk. Uh, also, I'll be more than happy to explain afterwards. It, it's, it can be, it depends, it, it, you know, it partially depends upon how your application works and interacts the database. But the idea is that new, call, like new stuff in the database overall doesn't affect old stuff. Like it doesn't hurt old stuff. So if you have a column that's being used, you still use it until you're ready, you know, and then you, you switch over the usages of it and then you get rid of that column. That makes sense? Um, so some uh, objections, uh, uh, like uh, some, some places have like a change management team, like we do have a change management team, it's like you have to, well we can advance, approve, you know, get these changes approved by some team that has no idea what you're doing. Um, you might have some compliance, like you have to meet these security specs, and we work with some automotive suppliers and that, or customers, and that gets fun. Um, you know, the, what happens when things go wrong? What happens when your just build just totally fails? Or not just the build, but the release is like all of a sudden the servers are down. They don't work. Well, uh, to handle change management, to kind of to kind of help uh, influence your organization is, is to give visibility and control to the people that do it. When you have automated your your deployment process with a pipeline in the end, you can give them that button to push quite easily. And say, oh, you, you guys can release it when you want. Here is the list of the, here's the release notes, here are the versions. If you want, I can go back to the build server and tell you what was built, who checked in, what, where it was. Um, that also goes into auditing. You can see who does what. Since with continuous delivery, every check-in builds a package, which then gets deployed to these environments and then gets promoted to these environments. And because of that, you kind of can trace it back all the way back to the programmer who made that change. Um, compliance. I mean, more automation. You don't need as much, you know, if you've got this documented set of requirements you need, why not just automate it? Make sure it's there. Do checks on it. Do tests. Uh, build it in if it's not. Uh, and then make it, e make it easy to fix outages. You've got to remember, not everything works perfectly, no matter how much automation you do. Gosh, oh my, how many times that I've, no matter how, many effort, how much effort I put in, things still go wrong. Um, and you've got to make it easy to fix outages. In the, most of the case for continuous delivery, because you've scripted and automated the deployment process, it's just a matter of uh, redeploying the earlier version. So there's no actual rollback. You just go back, redeploy. So here are some tools um, that can make continuous delivery easy. Like you said, uh, Jenkins, Jenkins is on here. Yeah. Um, ThoughtWorks released a tool called Go. It's open source. It's out there. Uh, it's very earthy. Um, uh, for .NET, how many of you guys are using .NET? Okay, cool. .NET, Octopus Deploy, hands down. Uh, absolutely fantastic tool. Uh, it's the type of tool that it seems to know what you want to do before you do it. Before you do. Before you know. Uh, Team City, great build server. They have some deployment capability. Um, Travis CI is popular. For your infrastructure, for .NET, there's PowerShell and Desire State configuration. It's fairly new. It's fairly po powerful. And next version, we'll have a package manager. So yeah, we get to have the, you know, Ruby Gems and App Yum and everything, <laughs> just like the open source. You know, the well, we can't call them the open source guys now because now we're all open source guys <laughs> and ladies, of course. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's getting better every version. 
And uh, you also have Chef and Puppet. And Jazz Humble actually works. I think he's the chief CE, COO of, of Chef now. And he used to work for ThoughtWorks. Uh, so yeah, there's some tools that can help make this a reality. But uh, I do want to say that the reason why I haven't shown you any code or any tooling was um, this is overall an organizational change. So the, these tools will not save you. Writing enough PowerShell scripts or Bash scripts or whatever will not, on its own, be the silver bullet. I mean, I think we oftentimes point to technology as a silver bullet. It's really, uh, what really it comes down to is changing the hearts and minds of the people, <laughs> changing the mindset, changing the culture. Uh, and, and the only way to change it is just like to write good software is to write it little by little, to change it little by little. When I came in to my product team, I was like, crap, this is a mess. Almost, they, we only had unit tests. Uh, they weren't running in any server. We had no CI. We had no build script. We had no configuration management. And I said, I, said, I just buckled down one day. I was like, boss, I'm, gonna write, I'm just gonna write this little build script. Take me a day. It, it took me about a day and a half. I wrote this build script, and now, now we can do all these things and we make these little packages. Oh, actually, that it wasn't even packages then. And then I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to set up a server. Uh, I'm just going to run building in the unit test. And then later, I was like, found Octopus Deploy. I'm like, you know what? I, can I just, I want to play around with this. Yeah. So it, bit by bit. And, I, I, you know, it, it meant also getting the, the other product team on board. Now, we had a small team, so it was, so it was easy. It, relatively easy. But it, I had to convince them. I had to talk to them and say where they're at and what I needed to do to change it. For, for all of you, it will be different, slightly, where you need to start, where you need to go. Uh, but it is always possible. It is always possible. It's just a little bit, just how do you, how do you eat an elephant? A little bit by bit. I think that one of the hardest challenges can be, where do you start? What do you start to do first to, to change? Uh, I had to prove what we were doing was good every step. Oh look, by building it, oh yeah, we need a new version. Okay, click. Oh, that was easy. Yeah, it was. Cool, I can, I can make this even better. I can make it, we can get, go even further with it. And let me tell you, when we got Octopus Deploy, where we could do push button deployments, oh, people were freaking out. My boss's boss's boss was like, freaking you, we have a lot of bosses. It's a big corporate place, but, uh, he was like, yes, we want this, let's do this. In fact, get the enterprise version. Okay. I, said, I just wanted the, the, you know, the 20 user version, but okay. So, it, oh. so um, that's, it, it, this is a high, it's sort of a high level talk about continuous delivery. So um, there might be a lot of questions because you know, there's the abstract idea and then how the heck do you actually make this a reality in your own context? So I'm gonna open this up for questions, and I will also love to spend anybody who's like, dude, you, you said some things, and I'm still trying to sort them out. Uh, I would, I'll spend, I'll con, I'll talk your ear off, by the way, but I would love to spend one-on-one -on -one or one or two time and help you in whatever way I can to kind of say, well, where do I start? Do, you, do I even want to do this? Uh, it's my firm belief continuous delivery will be as ubiquitous as Agile is now. In about three to five years, I think people, even if they're not doing it, will say that they're doing continuous delivery. <laughs> uh, okay, so you had your hand raised. So it's a question about you know how you change culture. Do you have any anything you can share with us on technique? Uh... Um, I'm not very political. Okay. Um, I not I'm kind of a blunt person. So I'm probably not the best in that, but what, what, what worked for my team was um, to show them. I just had to show them, okay, look, this little slice of it works and it makes sense. Okay, so let's take the next step. And, it, and, and we smooth out issues a bit, little bit at a time so that there's not, because if you tried to bite this off all at once, you'd get this pain. You'd get, you know, you'd get, you know, you, you might fall, just like a large project in software. So I would say uh, it's just got to be find the weak spot in your organization where you can affect the first change and take it from there. It could be you know wrapping up your config environments and separating them out. It could be you know adding a build script 
or it could be putting this on a server somewhere, you know. Does that help a little bit, maybe? Yep. yep. <laughs> uh, how do you get buy-in from management that this is a good use of resources, or if they, you go to them and they say, no, I don't think that's valuable, how do you, that, that's one step in the chain, how do you revisit or prove to the different constituents that